The question is the Scotland Bill programme number two motion as on the order paper. As many as that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Scotland Bill as amended in Committee of the Whole House to be considered. Now. We begin with Government New Clause 12, with which it will be convenient to consider the new clauses and amendments listed on the selection paper. Minister, Mr David Mundell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I believe this is a significant day for Scotland as we move the public debate about our country's future from questions of constitutional process and on to the real business of using power to improve people's lives. The Government's amendments, which I'd like to outline today, will strengthen the Scotland Bill's provisions and clarify its delivery of the Smith Commission Agreement. With that done, it will be time for Scotland's political parties to work together to make the new powers a success for everyone in Scotland. My ministerial colleagues, UK Government officials and I have engaged widely with interested parties in Civic Scotland to help people understand the Bill and to listen to their views. We have discussed the clauses with the Scottish Government and committees of both the Scottish and this Parliament, and we have reflected on constructive suggestions of how to improve the drafting of provisions. A number of technical amendments are proposed to ensure the Bill devolves the powers intended effectively and efficiently, as well as a range of substantive amendments which put beyond doubt that the Bill fully delivers the Smith Commission Agreement. Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to move a number of Government amendments to Part 1 of the Bill. We will discuss important amendments on welfare and other parts of the Bill uh, later today. Building on discussions on the permanence of the Scottish Parliament in Committee, I am bringing forward New Clause 12 and Amendment 34. The new clause removes the words recognised as and makes clear beyond question that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government are permanent institutions which which it would take a vote by the people of Scotland in a referendum ever to abolish. This amendment puts beyond all doubt that, as the Prime Minister has said, Scottish devolution is woven into the very fabric of our United Kingdom. New Clause 13 is a technical provision which ensures that where legislative confidence is being transferred to the Scottish Parliament in relation to elections, executive functions are transferred to the Scottish Ministers in relation to that area. This will minimise the need for the Scottish Parliament to make separate textual changes to legislation after commencement of the Bill. Amendments 81, 130 to 132 are consequential amendments to New Clause 13. Amendments 35 and 61 would deliver to the Scottish Parliament the subject matter of new subsection 2b of section 2 of the Scotland Act 1998, inserted by Clause 5 of the Bill. New subsection 2b enables Scottish ministers to make an order specifying an alternative date for a Scottish parliamentary general election, where otherwise the date would fall on the same day as an ordinary general election or a general election to the European Parliament. Government Amendments 36 and 44 to 45 clarify what is meant by combined elections. Amendment 36 makes clear that the reservation of the rules governing campaign expenditure by political parties apply where there are overlapping regulated periods, even if the actual polls take place on different days. Amendments 44 to 46 ensure consistency of language throughout the Bill by amending other provisions in Clause 7 concerned with expenditure in connection with elections. Amendment 131 inserts a reference to Clause 3 and has the effect of applying Schedule 3 to the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010 to any functions that are exercisable within devolved competence by virtue of that clause. The new wording included in Amendment 37 makes it clear that the Scottish Parliament will be able to give the Electoral Commission powers as well as duties when reporting on the delivery of its functions in relation to elections to the Scottish Parliament. 
Minor amendments 38 and 39 ensure that Scottish Ministers' powers to make provision on the conduct of Scottish Parliament elections are in line with the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament in this area. Amendment 40 is a minor change to align the subordinate legislation making powers of the Scottish Ministers with the extent of the reservation of the digital service. The Individual Electoral Registration Digital Service, which I shall refer to as the Digital Service, is the GB-wide service used to process online applications to verify information supplied in applications. It is used to process applications to the registers used for all GB elections as well as the EU parliamentary elections. Amendments 41 and 42 ensure that the power in Clause 5 to specify a new date for an ordinary Scottish parliamentary election works effectively with the presiding officer's existing power to propose to move the date of such a poll. Amendment 43 has the same purpose as the section of the clause it replaces to enable Scottish Ministers to exercise concurrently with the Secretary of State certain subordinate legislation making functions relating to the individual electoral registration digital service, which otherwise remains reserved. The effect of this is to allow Scottish Ministers to exercise functions and make regulations about the digital service. Amendments 47 to 60 seek to clarify rules on supermajority. A number of these are technical and consequential, but I will draw the attention to the House to the three main amendments in this group. Amendment 47 requires that the presiding officer must decide whether any provision of a bill re relates to a protected subject matter, rather than assessing the provisions of the bill more generally. Amendment 50 has the effect that a bill passed with a simple majority in respect of which the Supreme Court subsequently decides that a simple majority is sufficient must be reconsidered by the Scottish Parliament before being submitted for royal assent. I consider that it is important that the Scottish Parliament has the opportunity to reconsider the bill in this scenario as circumstances may have changed since the bill was first passed. Amendment 60, partly consequential on a number of other amendments, means that requirements regarding the final stage for a bill and for approval of a bill following reconsideration to be treated as the passing of the bill and apply regardless of the grounds for reconsideration. Government amendments 62 to 69 deliver new powers to the Scottish Parliament in relation to the arrangements and operation of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government in response to the amendments made at committee stage and discussions with the Scottish Government. This includes powers in relation to the dating of royal assent, the form and nature of certain statements made by the presiding officer, letters patent, appointments to the Scottish Government, the Auditor-General for Scotland and the Queen's Printer for Scotland. These amendments extend far-reaching powers of the arrangements and operation of the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government already provided by Clause 12 and address a number of amendments made at committee stage and by the SNP today. Yes, indeed. I am very grateful to the Secretary of State who is cantering through the uh, Government amendments. I wonder if he could uh, give some clarity, provide some clarity to the House with regards to these new amendments and whether or not that would require in the current context a legislative consent motion for the Trade Union Bill. What uh, the Honourable Gentleman will know is that the Trade Union Bill is still under discussion uh, in, uh, in this House and it is the Bill uh, that uh, as, uh, has been finalised by this House and the other place which will determine uh, the nature of any legislative consent motion which is required, which is the uh, normal practice in such uh, matters. Madam Deputy Speaker, the amendments I have tabled today fulfil my commitment to reflect on the debate uh, at a committee. And, uh, it is a bit rich to be criticised both for taking no amendments and then for, uh, in the same breath, lodging uh, too many uh, amendments. We took the committee process seriously. We took the contribution uh, by the devolved powers committee in the Scottish Parliament very seriously, and that has determined our thinking in lodging uh, these amendments. We'll hear now uh, the case for other uh, non-government uh, amendments, but the House will not uh, be surprised that the Government still considers that full fiscal autonomy is not in the interests of the people uh, of Scotland. 
I believe that Scotland's parties, rather than rerunning the referendum, need to work together to understand how the powers in the Bill will be used for the benefit of the people of Scotland. The UK Government is honouring its commitment in the Edinburgh Agreement, accepting the result of the referendum and moving forward to give the Scottish Parliament significant new powers within our United Kingdom. I beg to move the amendments in my name. Yeah.